Hello, and welcome to Let's Just Talk. I'm your host, Hami. Today, we'll be discussing the responsibility of big technology companies to protect human rights. To offer our thoughts on this issue, we are joined by Malika Saada Sar, a human rights lawyer who serves as YouTube's global head of human rights partnerships. Uh, she leads the platform's effort in working alongside activists, uh, nonprofit, and external partners to advance human rights issues, including in areas of criminal justice reform, gender equality, and racial justice. She was previously Google's senior counsel on civil and human rights. Uh, to begin, we have a series of questions prepared for our guests. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Malika, welcome to our show. We're Thank excited you. to have you here today. Excited to be here. Um, we're going to jump right in. Yeah. Um, so you are a human rights lawyer, mm -hmm. um, and you work within the tech space to advance human rights causes. Mm -hmm. uh, before we delve into our conversation about tech's responsibility to human rights, could you help us define what human rights is? Because it may mean different things mm -hmm. in different contexts and the human rights that we're going to be discussing today. Sure. So, I mean, there are all of the human rights treaties, right, that we know of. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think what's important for me to add in, in um, responding to your question is that mm -hmm. when I was first in law school, right. I was very interested in being a civil rights lawyer. Right. I went to law school in the tradition of Thurgood Marshall, Charles Houston, mm -hmm. and I was really interested in how do I use the law as an opportunity for justice and right. for change. Right. Um, and what I saw at that time was so much of our civil rights law mm. had been gutted. Mm. Um, and so that opportunity to think through what is a larger body of mm. law and thinking and discourse right. that goes to the notion of the foundational dignity mm -hmm. of individuals, of minority groups. Mm. Um, and that's why human rights law was so important to me because right. it allows for that thinking of the basic foundational rights of every single human being mm -hmm. with special language and concern mm -hmm. around minority groups. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was drawn to that language right. um, and, and also really fascinated by how do you, how do you take that language of human rights, mm -hmm. discourse and law and apply it at global scale that is inclusive of the US. Mm -hmm. So the beginning of my human rights work was actually very focused on the US okay. and how to contemplate human rights discourse and law and strategy mm -hmm. within the US mm -hmm. and, and very much focused on the implications of that for women and girls in this country. Okay. Thank you so much for summing that up for us. Mm -hmm. And how does all of that fit into the tech space? Mm -hmm. How did you transfer um, the knowledge that you've acquired, the values and the principles that you hold, and bring that into the tech space? Well, I always say I did not become a human rights lawyer to work for Google or mm -hmm. YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, when I became a human rights lawyer, it was for the sole purpose of doing the work within NGOs, civil society. Mm -hmm. um, and then I heard this amazing speech that was delivered um, by the head of Unilever at the time. Mm. And I w you know, wasn't really, Unilever was one of my funders, I didn't, I didn't really want to be there. Right. <laughs> but the speech was about how corporations mm -hmm. can have as much impact mm -hmm. on human rights as governments civil so and civil society. Right. And, and, and the way that um, he outlined that, I, I almost fell off my chair because I, I had never heard mm -hmm. that kind of authentic way of understanding the potential and the power mm -hmm. of corporations in the human rights space. When I went to law school, it was all about how do you sue the corporations yeah. around human rights violations, right. but to have it flipped and to think about how you can leverage corporations to actually be the biggest and best um, leaders of mm. human rights in certain areas was fascinating to me. Mm. And after I heard um, that speech and, and also saw the work that Unilever was doing in the climate change and sustainability space and leading at that time, mm. um, I, I was invited by Google to, to join them. And mm. I'm not sure I would have said yes. Right. If, if I didn't hear that type of critique. Mm -hmm. And that has been the basis of why I'm at a big tech firm. 
Um, it has been my first experience of mm -hmm. being outside of the NGO space. Mm -hmm. And I walk into tech with the idea of human rights lawyers need to be technologists. Right. That this is a terrain of, this is a frontier and a terrain where issues of rights, justice, and dignity are being wrestled with, sought after, mm -hmm. adhered to, or violated every single day. Right. And how can I, as a human rights lawyer, be part of the conversation mm -hmm. in these very, very critical places? Right. So you just mentioned how human rights lawyers need to be technologists as well. Mm -hmm. um, I want to flip that and mm -hmm. talk about the need for technologists uh -huh. to work through human rights lenses. 100%. So the people who design our algorithms, the people mm -hmm. who design our artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. all like, just regular folks who mm -hmm. learned how to do these things. Mm -hmm. So then how do we make sure or ensure that the people who are in these spaces have the human rights values that you are speaking of? Yeah, well, first of all, I think representation is key. Mm -hmm. So we have to do the work of ensuring that in the pipeline, mm -hmm. we have engineers who are representative. Right. So that when we talk about how bias can be baked into algorithms, right. we are ensuring that there is the, the lived experience, the background, the diversity of who we are reflected in those who are creating the algorithms. Mm -hmm. I think that's essential. But the other piece is that we can't talk about these algorithms as if they're neutral, right? right? We have to talk about algorithms in the context of systemic bias. We have mm -hmm. to talk about algorithms in the context of structural racism, mm -hmm. in the context of gender bias. Mm -hmm. if, we don't do the, if we don't do that, then we act as if these algorithms come out of nothing right. um, and exist in, in neutrality, which they don't. So I do think that conversation of how do we give the, the, the individuals who create these algorithms mm -hmm. that type of understanding around mm -hmm. dynamics and power of race and gender and sexuality is absolutely key. We have to understand the intersection mm -hmm. around identity, lived experience, racial, gendered, power mm -hmm. dynamics and the creation of these algorithms. And I think to take it another step further, really talking about the importance of what does it mean to innovate and create from a rights-based framework right. and invite so many of our coders, our engineers, our technologists to really think about their responsibility mm -hmm. of innovating from a rights-based lens. Right. and the kind of apps and the kind of new products and the kind of new technologies that can be created that advance human rights mm -hmm. as opposed to jeopardize them. Thank you for that. Um, to pivot a little bit, um, every piece of technology that we use today, all of us are complicit in this, mm -hmm. including so like our iPhones, uh, mm -hmm. computers, mm -hmm. the cars that we drive, mm -hmm. depend on resources uh, from the developing world, mm -hmm. uh, such as cobalt from the Congo, right. um, or labor from the developing mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. And these are usually places that have been de devastated by these industries. So then my question to you is, what is and should be technology companies' mm -hmm. responsibilities to these communities that are impacted by their endeavors? Yeah, there is an effort on the part of many companies to put forward how they are not complicit with modern day slavery. Okay. And when we talk about child slave labor mm -hmm. in, in places like the Congo, and yes, the connection between their exploited labor and cobalt, there is this work that is happening around mm -hmm. ensuring that our companies are not complicit with that right. um, and being able to require anti-modern day slavery statements mm -hmm. from corporations that give proof mm -hmm. to how there is not the use of slave labor or child labor in mm -hmm. our supply chains. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely critical and it is something that we have to ensure is not part of our supply chains. Mm -hmm. And if we wanted to, we could make this entire conversation about like the problems that exist mm -hmm. in this technology mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. human rights space. Yep. But I want to pivot to talk about how can artificial intelligence uh, or like just technology, the technology space in general, help us generate solutions to uh, complex human rights challenges mm -hmm. that we haven't been able to solve. Yeah. Well, look, um, you know, the, the movie just came out on Mamie Till, on Emma Till's mm -hmm. mother. Um, and, you know, it's the, the story of her courage in saying after her boy was 
was kidnapped and um, murdered, lynched, mutilated, that she wanted the coffin to be open because mm -hmm. she wanted the world to bear witness to what racism and white supremacy did to her child. Right. That idea of bearing witness is core to human rights work. Mm -hmm. It is core to mobilization for justice. It right. is core to our movement building. Mm -hmm. What Darnella Frazier did decades later by saying, I'm going to be courageous enough to record a modern day lynching mm -hmm. of George Floyd right. is also about that moment of the power to bear witness mm -hmm. and using our mobile devices, which can be human rights tools, mm -hmm. to bear witness and then to share that content on the global stage mm -hmm. through Facebook, through Twitter, through YouTube. Right. I really believe in that. And mm -hmm. I think that is part of where the power and the promise is right. to leverage technology for justice. Mm -hmm. It is not a mistake mm -hmm. that any time we see human rights movements in abusive countries, right. they shut down the internet. That's right. what we're seeing right now in Iran. Right. And because we understand that when we use these technologies mm -hmm. so that the world bears witness, right. there is the opportunity for engagement mm -hmm. and for disruption. Right. That, is my, that is my cornerstone belief mm -hmm. right, in how technology is the place of power and promise right. for human rights and for social mobilization and for justice. Mm -hmm. I'm very aware that it can, we are also in a place where those tools, those technologies mm -hmm. can be used against human rights, right. that they can be used to surveil human rights right. defenders. But it's important to me that we hold this place of mm -hmm. the promise and that we encourage more citizen journalists right. to be out there and to use their phones and to use the global platforms right. to share abuses. Because any, any individual or, or people who have endured abuse understand that abuse is allowed to thrive in silence right. and isolation. And how do we use these technologies to break the isolation mm -hmm. and the darkness right. and the silence right. that always protects the abuse of rights? Right. Thank you so much for that. Um, that was very insightful. And so uh, then what can we as normal citizens who may or may not be part of the tech space mm -hmm. uh, do to incentivize or to ask tech companies to center human rights? How do we, as you know, part of Gen Z or mm -hmm. whatever you mm -hmm. want to call it, um, demand that our the technologies and the resources that we use mm -hmm. uh, put human rights at the center of everything that they do? Well, I have a lot of belief in Gen Zs, right? <laughs> I, I think <laughs> I think you all are doing it, right. um, and I think that there is a way in which you know my generation um, expected corporations to do CSR, mm -hmm. right? Give to philanthropy make sure that they are um, acting in a way that shows charity. Mm -hmm. Gen Z's are saying, mm -mm, mm -hmm. we don't really care about that. What matters are the ways in which corporations are really showing commitments, not right. performative commitment, right. but enduring commitment to issues of sustainability, racial justice, LGBTQ rights. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is powerful. Mm -hmm. And it is what opens up the tech space and other corporate spaces to human rights lawyers right. and to others who care about justice to say it ought to be the DNA of the company right. and not simply a marginal act. Mm -hmm. um, I think this generation is core to mm -hmm. that. And I think as a result, changing the way corporations are behaving, including mm -hmm. the tech sector. Right. Thank you so much. And um, I want to turn back mm -hmm. to the question of how can we prevent mm. um, some of the obstacles and the challenges that we're seeing in this space. Mm. Uh, an example that I can think of is that it took Twitter's AI, uh, artificial intelligence, mm. like 15 hours to teach their bots how to be racist and sexist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. So then how do we prevent that from happening? Like we know that 
the technology that we're creating is capable of so much good, mm -hmm. but also of so much harm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. then how do we ensure that there's people like you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, at the center of these tables? Mm -hmm. Because like you said, it's about having more of people like mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. in those spaces. But mm -hmm. how do we do that? Right. I certainly, I can't argue that I'm at the center of the table, but yeah. uh, <laughs> but that's the work is, is you know, I, I was joking that, um, you know, when I was in law school, it, it really was about seeing corporations as the enemy and, right. and how do we go after them. And um, I only saw my role as a human rights lawyer within the context of NGOs and civil society. Mm -hmm. And I think now the languaging in law schools and not only in law schools, in other spaces where people want to do justice. The languaging has to be, how do we encourage individuals to think about their work in the mm -hmm. context of tech? And so from a human rights legal perspective, mm -hmm. you know, human rights in the way that we teach it in law school also has to be an opportunity and an invitation mm -hmm. to go into the tech sector right. and to have classes around the intersection of human rights and technology. Right. This, you know, as, as human rights lawyers and as civil rights lawyers, you look at the 20th century, right? And mm -hmm. the work of the 20th century was really taking the circles of law and economics and culture and pushing for racial justice, right? Pushing for justice for queer communities, pushing for justice for gender and um, understanding the need for gender equity. Mm -hmm. That is where the work was done. And right. when we, we were in law school, that's where we were told to go. Mm -hmm. Law, economics, culture. Mm -hmm. um, and I think now it's important to add tech to okay. that. That this is a new opportunity mm -hmm. and space for us to say, this is where there is the expectation so of So basically human the rights. institutions that are responsible for training these future change makers should be pushing this narrative as well. A hundred percent. Thank you for 100%. that. And so I want to go to uh, how can governments and tech companies collaborate to ensure that they're upholding human rights values? Um, well, sometimes... Which is loaded. Right. Well, and also I would say that sometimes um, not all governments are invested in human rights. Right. So I'm not sure that we want that collaboration, right? True. Um, so I, I think it's important. I, I think that that space of tech companies regulating themselves mm -hmm. and creating um, their own guidelines, guidelines around hate and harassment and bias mm -hmm. are very critical and then being held accountable for those those um, principles and guidelines that mm -hmm. we've established. And then what are some promising uh, changes have you seen in the space to address hate speech, to address violence, to address human rights violations? You know, I think not just at um, not just at, at YouTube, but I think across the board, um, tech has really been grappling and reckoning with issues of free speech, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, really starting out as platforms that were clear that all speech was good speech mm -hmm. and it was, and all speech was under this, you know, framework of free speech. Mm -hmm. And then learning that, well, there's such a thing as hate speech. Right. And we have to be able to discern what is free speech and what is hate speech. And then being able to understand that hate speech is also connected to history and culture mm -hmm. and politics and understanding that we have to be able to do that at global scale, right? That we have to have the understanding of culture and history and hate, mm -hmm. not just within one region, but across the globe. And, right. and that is challenging and demanding but, we but have I think to do it. that's what we have to do, and I think I, I think tech companies are really understanding that and and trying to grapple with that. Um, mm -hmm. It is hard, and I'm, I'm incredibly proud of um, the work that's being done to really reckon with how do we understand and construe what hate speech is, and how do we also honor free speech. Right. Um, one of we're nearing towards the end so one of the questions that i wanted to ask you was what has your experience been like as a woman of color in this space um how do you navigate it uh how do you find spaces for yourself yeah um, while also making sure that company cultures are changing for the better yeah yeah it's an interesting question because i 
I, I don't know the corporate space outside of where I am now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the NGO space was a space where I always felt um, respected as a woman of color. Mm -hmm. um, I always felt that I, I, my intellectual abilities were never contested. Mm -hmm. um, corporate culture is different, um, and, um, and it, it, it has been a learning curve. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also a learning curve to come out of a sensibility and an over 15 year experience of the NGO world where mm -hmm. you wake up every morning with the idea of, okay, how, how am I changing the world? How am I fighting for justice? How am I making things better? Right. And you work with other people who are struggling and asking themselves those same questions right. around goodness and justice and the work. Mm -hmm. It's not the language of tech um, and learning how to hold on to that language of rights and justice in the context of learning the new language mm. that is tech and um, being comfortable as an outlier right. because I come from a background that is not necessarily reflected back mm -hmm. in those that I work with. Mm -hmm. And I think as a woman of color, feeling very responsible to other individuals of color mm -hmm. and feeling very responsible for how we have to do the work of equity and representation within the company. Right. Because I think that we're at a place, whether it's YouTube or it's Warner Brothers mm -hmm. or it's Amazon mm -hmm. um, or it's a university setting mm -hmm. where if we are not equitable, if we are not representative, if we are not anti-racist, mm -hmm. then we are not competitive. Right. We are irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is very much the reality of where we are now mm -hmm. and even more of where we're headed. Right. And I think for me as a woman of color, what I am very committed to is how do we make sure that that commitment to anti-racism, to equity, mm -hmm. is the DNA of the company. Right. That it's not a sideshow, right. that it's not considered an act of philanthropy, right. that it is the very DNA of how we do the work especially because of the power that we have mm -hmm. as a tech company in terms of the products that we create mm -hmm. and the example that we set. So there's an incredible sense of responsibility right. that I feel um, being at YouTube. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, lastly, how do we reframe and reimagine technology in all spaces mm. to advance human rights and do you have any last minute thought that you want to, you know, send us away with? <laughs> um, well, I, I do want to go back to how um, this notion of digital freedom fighters, right? right. Digital human rights defenders. Mm -hmm. I do see Darnella Frazier as an example of that digital human rights defender. Um, and I think that more and more we have opportunities to use these devices as human rights tools right. and to use these technologies as that. How do we create interconnectedness? Mm -hmm. How do we create adjacency? Because those places of connection and adjacency mm -hmm. allowed us to move as more of a collective, mm -hmm. allow us to understand our shared humanity. And so I, I very much believe in the opportunity mm -hmm. of the next decade is an opportunity to take technology, right. to take these devices, to take these platforms, and really urge that we use them for the purposes of human rights. Because if instead they are only weaponized against us, if they are only about taking away right. our rights, mm -hmm. surveilling our bodies, mm -hmm then all of the possibility right, of digital freedom-based movements mm -hmm. um, are compromised. Yes. And when I look at Me Too, mm -hmm. when I look at Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. these are digital movements for freedom and justice and rights. Right. And I believe in that future. And part of believing in that future is believing that we have to 
take advantage that we have to be technologists, mm -hmm. that we have to be digital defenders of rights and justice. And that is the path that is there for us. And it's the path that I really urge those who are the beginning of their education, the beginning of their careers to really take seriously. Inspiration. Thank um, you. Malika Saadasar, thank you for being on Let's Just Talk. Yeah, um, it was you. amazing speaking with you. Thank and you. And we look forward to continuing this work with you. Thank you so much. Bless me.